Ladies and gentlemen, dear friends, it's my pleasure to be here again with you as editor-in-chief of GREM, the new open access journal of uh, the International Society of Gynecological Endocrinology. We continue our tradition to present our authors. Uh, this time we have chosen a paper from Laura Cucinella of the group of uh, Rossella Nappi in Pavia. Laura Cucinella, she is uh, an, uh, working with that group since several years and she has also published and seen several papers together with Rossella. And uh, today the presentation will be devoted to that publication, which was very attractive for us. It's uh, a paper on natural premature ovarian insufficiency and early menopause, a snapshot of hormonal management in a real life setting in Italy. We are interested because uh, this is a chapter who also have inside new vision about hormone replacement therapy after menopause, possibilities, limits, and, uh, and uh, also because uh, she is bringing a very positive message for our readers. I would like before to introduce you, Laura, who is in front of us. I would like to thank all who participated writing and sending the papers to our journal. I remind you that we have a very successful conference in Florence, distributed online and still present online. If you go on ISG 2020, you can still follow and see all the conference until the 15th of April. And uh, now I don't want to take you more time and I invite uh, Laura to share with us uh, her uh, screen and to start uh, the presentation. Please, Laura, you have the microphone. Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you very much, Professor Genazzani, for the opportunity to be here and uh, uh, discuss with you the result of our study about uh, management uh, of natural menopause, uh, uh, premature ovarian insufficiency and early menopause. Um, first of all, I would like to start with uh, a few key concepts about these conditions. Uh, loss of ovarian activity before the age of 40 is um, uh, defined as uh, premature ovarian insufficiency, while when uh, menopause occurs between 40 and, four, and 45 years, uh, it defines early menopause. And the prevalence of the first condition is uh, uh, about 1% according to uh, epidemiological data, while uh, early menopause uh, affects about 5%. But very recently, uh, a meta-analysis estimated that the pool prevalence may be much higher for both the conditions, uh, reaching 3.7% uh, for premature ovarian insufficiency and 12% for early menopause. Um, we know that the loss of ovarian activity uh, can result uh, from um, iatrogenic causes, uh, including surgery, uh, chemotherapy, radiotherapy, uh, or maybe spontaneous. And we have chosen to focus our attention on spontaneous or natural uh, early menopause and premature ovarian insufficiency, uh, which are currently uh, diagnosed according to um, the available guidelines uh, in women with uh, oligo or amenorrhea for at least four months, uh, with the finding of elevated FSH on at least two occasions, four weeks apart, with a, a cutoff variable according to difference guidelines between 25 and 40 international units. Um, let's see the causes of uh, um, natural premature ovarian insufficiency and early menopause. Um, we can have a genetic insult that may be uh, a chromosomal abnormality, particularly Turner syndrome with the full presentation or uh, mosaicism, uh, fragile X permutation, and also uh, 
autosomal and X-linked uh, uh, mutations uh, that are increasingly being detected thanks to uh, uh, genome sequencing techniques. Autoimmune conditions are very uh, common in PY patients with a prevalence uh, uh, of about uh, between 4 to uh, 30 percent, according to different surveys. Uh, less common causes are infectious and metabolic disease, but uh, uh, what is uh, uh, really um, important is that uh, despite uh, um, uh, full examinations, uh, a real cause cannot be detected in up to 70 uh, to 90 percent of the cases, and these are uh, defined as idiopathic POI and early menopause. Um, familiarity is still a strong predictor uh, because up to uh, 30 percent of POI women has a familiarity for the condition, um, mainly from maternal lineage. Uh, even if, uh, uh, even when a um, uh, specific genetic defect cannot be identified. Uh, loss of ovarian function means uh, low premature uh, hormonal deprivation. So, uh, first of all, estrogens, but also other sex steroids, including androgens. And uh, uh, we know that uh, this profound and premature uh, lack of uh, sex steroids uh, leads to short-term symptoms and long-term consequences. Short-term symptoms include menopausal symptoms, vasomotor uh, symptoms, uh, sleep disorder, psychological and cognitive symptoms, genitourinary problems affecting also sexual function, uh, arthralgia and other musculoskeletal symptoms. While uh, long-term consequences include, uh, of course, infertility, which uh, uh, represents a, a, a very uh, severe concern for uh, these young people who may have a diagnosis very early in their 20s or uh, 30s. And uh, um, of course, uh, we have uh, uh, all consequences long-term linked to hypoestrogenism with increased cardiovascular risk disease, including uh, um, coronary artery disease and stroke, uh, decreased bone mineral density, so increased risk of osteoporosis and osteoporotic fractures, increased neurocognitive risk, and overall uh, higher risk of multimorbidity, even at midlife before 60 years of age. So uh, overall, uh, premature ovarian insufficiency and early menopause represent uh, a life-changing diagnosis because these young women, uh, women um, uh, find themselves to face uh, a reduced quality of life linked to these short-term symptoms, but also a reduced life expectancy, particularly from cardiovascular disease risk. Um, Basically, all guidelines from uh, the scientific societies um, are uh, in agreement, uh, saying that uh, the management, the mainstay of management of POI and early menopause is represented by hormone therapy. Um, it is uh, uh, the first line treatment, both to relieve uh, estrogen deficiency symptoms and as a primary prevention. And hormone therapy should be started early after diagnosis and continued at least until the age of menopause, so about 50, 51 years. Then uh, treatment should be uh, reevaluated and individualized according to personal risk factors and clinical pictures. Um, local estrogen, uh, of course, uh, uh, should be uh, prescribed when genitourinary syndromes are not adequately relieved uh, by systemic treatment. <coughs> and uh, as we, um, as I said before, um, women with POI may also need uh, supplementation with androgen through testosterone formulations, transdermal. Uh, especially when uh, uh, there's a problem with low libido affecting sexuality. Um, another important issue in uh, these women is counseling, both about uh, 
uh, lifestyle intervention to decrease uh, the burden of cardiovascular risk and also osteoporotic risk, but also uh, from a psychological point of view. Uh, this table summarized from a recent review uh, the main indications of uh, uh, hormone replacement therapy in women with POI. So um, this is just to uh, highlight once more that uh, uh, HR, uh, hormone replacement therapy in these uh, patients uh, does not uh, only um, as an indication to treat symptoms and possibly in improving the quality of life, but uh, as an intention of a, pre uh, of a primary prevention, especially we have uh, most data uh, on uh, prevention of uh, uh, bone mineral density loss and cardiovascular risk. Uh, but it seems also that uh, it may have a uh, positive uh, uh, impact on neurological function, even though most data come from uh, patients uh, uh, who um, had a surgical menopause, so uh, mm, less data are available for natural premature ovarian insufficiency and the role of uh, hormone therapy uh, concerning neurological protection. Um, life expectancy, there are no direct data, but of course um, it is expected that uh, reducing cardiovascular health, uh, risk disease, we will uh, improve life expectancy as well. Uh, so <clears throat> guidelines say that we should start uh, uh, hormone therapy early in our patients and continue until the age of menopause. but which is the best hormone therapy to choose in our patients? Uh, this is a difficult question uh, because uh, the studies that are, have compared uh, different treatment regimens um, are very few in this population and also guidelines uh, show some inconsistencies between one another. Uh, this because we have to take uh, uh, into account uh, several aspects. Uh, so first of all, the type of uh, estrogen supplementation, but also the type of uh, progestogen or pro uh, or progesterone used for endometrial protection. Um, we have to take in consideration the dose, the route of administration, and also um, the uh, patient uh, need in terms of uh, contraception and desire for pregnancy, because we have to, uh, we have to remind that um, spontaneous ovulation can uh, occur in these women. Uh, in about 25% of women, uh, there are hormonal fluctuations still after uh, the diagnosis and in up to 5% uh, of these women uh, a spontaneous, uh, spontaneous pregnancy can occur. So also contraception need is something that we have to take into account. Um, <clears throat> so this is from a very recently published uh, um, white paper on premature ovarian insufficiency by the International Menopause Society. And uh, it's very, uh, um, the authors, they, um, they suggest uh, not recommendations, uh, but the principles uh, to follow to prescribe uh, hormone therapy in uh, POI women. And as you can see, um, they say that hormone replace should be identical to those that are missing. So um, we should prefer uh, estradiol rather than if you need estradiol or conjugated um, equine estrogens. That non-oral estrogen delivery route offer advantages in terms of uh, thromboembolic risk. And that the estrogen doses should be generally higher than that used in natural menopause. And this is a summary of the uh, available options. And you see that uh, the authors put the um, 
dose, uh, the, the higher POI doses beside the um, uh, low to standard doses used for uh, uh, physiologically menopause women at midlife. So uh, this is just to say that uh, um, it's not as uh, simple to uh, define the optimal uh, hormonal treatment in POI uh, and early menopause women. Uh, as is stated uh, also in the guidelines themselves in uh, uh, European Society Human uh, of Human Re Reproduction, they say that recommendation uh, for hormone replacement therapy in POI is based more on uh, knowledge about the physiology and endocrinology or data extrapolated from uh, studies performed in natural uh, menopause uh, occurring at physiological age. So in this, uh, uh, with, with this premise, uh, of course, uh, uh, recommendations are based on mainly on best clinical practice and the patient preference is very important to uh, take into account, uh, given also the paucity of uh, um, evidences, because we have to uh, we have to uh, take in mind that these patients uh, are going to take uh, hormone therapy even for a long time, much longer than physiologically menopausal women. So compliance is uh, uh, very fundamental in these patients. So uh, pre patient preference uh, do, um, is really something that we have to take into account when we're prescribing uh, hormone um, therapy. And now we go to uh, our results. Uh, in uh, Pavia, at the Departmental Unit of Reproductive Medicine of the University of Pavia, we run a specialized uh, uh, clinic dedicated to POI and early menopause uh, patients. And uh, we are collecting uh, data. We have started since uh, 2019. Um, and we decided to um, analyze our data in a retrospective observational study with the aim of uh, have a better insight on the prescriptive habits of hormonal management in this population. Uh, we included women with uh, at least one year of amenorrhea with elevated FSH or oligomenorrhea with uh, elevated FSH on two occasions. Of course, diagnosis, uh, age diagnosis uh, um, was uh, of the included patient had to be um, uh, below 45 years. Uh, we excluded uh, women with primary, um, with uh, primary amenorrhea, so they, they had to have a spontaneous menarche. Uh, we uh, ex excluded women who had pelvic surgery in the past, and of course, uh, we included uh, uh, patients uh, um, um, able to uh, present an accurate personal and family history and report drug history regarding past and actual use of systemic and local hormone therapy. We analyze the clinical characteristics, the etiology, the age diagnosis, the reproductive history, and the use of hormones and other drugs, including uh, natural supplements. Um, we included 148 women with a spontaneous POI or early menopause. Um, the mean age of our sample was about uh, 43 years, and the median age of diagnosis was uh, 39 years. Um, our patients uh, were uh, mostly normal weight with a median bo um, body mass index uh, of 22. They had spontaneous menarche uh, at a median age of 12 years. And they were um, menopausal since 5.5 years, uh, I mean, the, the median a time since menopause. Um, as far as the etiology and family history, a positive uh, family history was found uh, in 30%, so absolutely in line with 
with the data from epidemiological, epidemiological studies. Uh, we detected uh, genetic abnormalities in 5.4% uh, of our uh, sample. Uh, three cases uh, had a positive family history, and uh, we found uh, a normal karyotype gonadal dysgenesis, a fragile X permutation, and a chromosomal translocation. While the other five cases uh, did not report the family history, uh, three of them uh, were found to have a mosaicism for um, uh, ex-monosomy, so uh, Turner syndrome uh, mosaicism. Uh, we had a uh, Perot syndrome, which is a, a normal karyotype gonadal dysgenesis associated with uh, neurosensorial uh, deafness, and a case of chromosomal translocation. Um, also, autoimmune conditions were very common in, uh, in our sample, affecting 35% uh, uh, of uh, patients. Uh, both endocrine and non-endocrine autoimmune disorder uh, were found. Um, the most frequently uh, reported were uh, was thyroid disease, including hyper and hypothyroidism, uh, which affected uh, 22 of our patients. And also very common was undifferentiated connectivitis. Um, uh, 43% of uh, uh, POI early menopause in our uh, sample never achieved pregnancy. And as expected, they were um, significantly younger at uh, diagnosis with a mean age of diagnosis of uh, uh, 33 years compared to uh, women who reported at least one pregnancy. Um, 17 women, so 11%, uh, uh, reported use of assisted reproductive technology. Um, while as far as the uh, lifestyle factors um, are concerned, uh, smoking was uh, quite common in our sem uh, sample uh, with 22% ultra smokers. Um, also, alcohol and caffeine consumption were uh, quite common, while uh, most of our, um, of our patients did not report regular physical exercise. So, 58% uh, reported physical inactivity. Uh, we did not find um, uh, differences uh, in median age diagnosis according to lifestyle factors. And here we have the uh, pl we have plotted the um, age range at, the, at, at diagnosis, as you can see uh, on the left. Um, about two thirds of our sample were diagnosed before 40 years of age, uh, while uh, about one third um, fall in the uh, classification of early menopause. So they received their diagnosis between 40 and, 40 and uh, 45 years. Um, on the right, you see uh, we plotted the uh, median age at uh, median duration of menopause according to different uh, age groups uh, and we did not find um, significant differences. Uh, it is important to mention that uh, uh, most women uh, in our sample uh, reported characteristics of late postmenopause. So um, they uh, receive a diagnosis uh, more than six years uh, before data collection. So about uh, half of them were in late menopause, postmenopause, and 35% uh, um, uh, reported characteristics of early postmenopause. So between one and six years of amenorrhea, so from last menstrual period. And this uh, uh, is in line with the um, uh, 
consultation that we, we often uh, we often do. I mean, uh, many uh, must women that come to our clinic, uh, uh, they already have a diagnosis of uh, POI in the past or early menopause in the past, and they come for a re-evaluation um, of the treatment or counseling about uh, risk factors, uh, doubts about uh, uh, treatment continuation for a long time, and so on and so forth. Um, the, um, this slide uh, shows the uh, overall use of hormone therapy, including both uh, hormone replacement therapy and combined hormonal contraception. And as you can see, um, most of our women uh, were actually on uh, uh, systemic hormone therapy, uh, reaching 67%. Um, in 19% of the cases, um, uh, the use of hormone therapy was, uh, was in the past, so they discontinued uh, hormone therapy. Um, and the mean age of uh, discontinuation was uh, 43 years. Uh, a minority of women, but of course, uh, uh, mm, are relevant, it is relevant. Uh, to notice that they uh, never received uh, a prescription of hormone therapy. Some of them probably because uh, uh, they were uh, newly diagnosed with the condition, uh, other because of uh, cardiovascular risks mainly, um, with history of thromboembolic disease or uncontrolled hypertension or uh, migraine with oral. Um, past users, as expected, were significantly older, uh, with a mean age of uh, 48 years, compared to current users and never users. Mm, here, instead, we uh, can see the different types of prescription. Uh, as you can see, uh, must of the uh, patient were treated with a hormone replacement therapy, uh, mainly uh, with oral formulations uh, rather than a transdermal HRT, uh, while combined hormonal contraception was uh, prescribed only in 12.5%. Uh, uh, these women on uh, combined hormonal contraception had the higher chance of discontinued treatment. So uh, they discontinued uh, uh, therapy in 50% compared to 18% of patients who discontinued the hormone replacement therapy. The median duration uh, of hormone therapy overall was 48 months, but uh, what uh, is uh, more relevant is uh, um, the, uh, the, let's say the menopausal lifespan being treated with systemic HRT that we uh, calculated uh, upon age, actual age, age of diagnosis, and total months of use. And we found that overall, the women in our sample spent 67% uh, of their menopausal lifespan being treated with systemic uh, hormone therapy. And even more reassuring, let's say, is the data uh, about uh, uh, women who uh, were aged at least 51 years at the time of data collection, uh, and because they have spent uh, more than 80% of, the of their menopause lifespan being treated with systemic hormone therapy with a mean duration of 150 months, so basically 12 years of treatment. Um, local uh, hormone therapy is uh, important to uh, promote, uh, uh, to treat uh, genitourinary symptoms in this patient, and uh, the rate of prescription is, uh, was quite high despite the um, young age of our uh, sample. You see that 29% of women was uh, currently using uh, local hormone therapy. 
and uh, uh, it is interesting to note that uh, um, the uh, rate of prescription was higher in past user of the systemic hormone therapy compared to current and ever users. Um, the uses of local hormone therapy were also um, significantly older than non-users and they went through menopause uh, a little bit later than non-users, so 50 years versus 30 years. And this is a table that uh, uh, summarizes uh, all the uh, mm, treatment uh, mm, types and products uh, used uh, uh, by, other, uh, by our uh, patient. And uh, you can see uh, we have a, a wide variety of products. Um, I just focus uh, uh, your attention on uh, few uh, aspects. So as far as the combined hormonal contraception is concerned, um, our women uh, were um, mostly prescribed with uh, estradiol containing uh, pills rather than etinyl estradiol. Um, <clears throat> and this um, is uh, uh, in line with, uh, it's based on uh, um, a more uh, similar um, approach to hormone replacement therapy uh, based on possible uh, more favorable cardio, uh, cardiovascular uh, impact meta and metabolic impact and also um, <clears throat> and also uh, bone health. Um, Turning to hormone replacement therapy, uh, natural products were mainly used, so estradiol rather than uh, uh, other uh, estrogens like combined, uh, uh, like uh, conjugated equine estrogens. Um, and also, as far as the progestin is concerned, uh, oral, uh, um, oral uh, hormone replacement therapy were mainly prescribed uh, in combination with uh, the hydrogesterone, which is uh, the uh, more similar to natural progesterone, while transdermal HRT uh, was prescribed with... Um, macronized progesterone on both vaginal uh, or uh, oral. And uh, um, let's see instead about the dosage, uh, we found that uh, we used uh, the, the patient in our uh, database mainly used uh, standard to low dose uh, for estrogen supplementation. Um, <clears throat> both for transdermal formulation and for uh, oral formulation. And um, this is something that uh, may be concerning um, because uh, we, know, we, we really don't know uh, if uh, uh, this may uh, be enough to um, uh, relieve the symptoms, but especially for longer term consequences to prevent uh, uh, longer term risks. Um, estriol was the most uh, local estrogen prescribed, following by uh, estradiol. Um, plant extracts and supplements were prescribed uh, only in a minority of patients, and also psychoactive agents were used just in one out of ten women uh, in our sample. So. <clears throat> To discuss our result, um, we found um, promising results, but also we highlight uh, some possible gaps in uh, management in uh, hormone ma uh, manage hormonal management uh, of uh, women with POI and early menopause. So um, the rate of uh, uh, hormone therapy prescription was uh, quite high with. Uh, 86% uh, uh, of the women treated, considering both uh, 
actual um, treatment and past users. And this highlights a high level of awareness of this condition as a real hormone uh, deficiency to be treated. Um, the type of hormone therapy uh, prescribed was mostly in agreement with the principles suggested by guidelines. So uh, the, particularly the use of estradiol rather than etinyl estradiol and conjugated equine estrogen and the use of natural progesterone or progesterone more similar to uh, natural progesterone more similar to natural progesterone. Um, only a minority of women received the combined hormonal contraception based on contraceptive needs. And in most cases, an estradiol con containing pill was prescribed. Uh, most patients receive oral hormone therapy despite uh, uh, guidelines and recommendations that um, suggest um, to choose a non-oral administration, um, especially to reduce the um, prothrombotic risk factor uh, associated with uh, oral administration. But uh, uh, as we uh, seen before, um, the uh, competence of the patient and preference of the patient uh, do really matter in uh, prescription and uh, uh, oral formulation may be more convenient and more suitable for young um, women uh, instead of uh, patches and uh, estradiol uh, gel, which may be uh, more unpractical. Uh, Tibolon serums and TSEC were, were uh, rarely prescribed. Um, and this was uh, quite expected uh, because the lack of data of their use in, the, in, our, in this population and uh, the uh, presence of fixed dosage at low and low uh, estrogenic uh, effects, uh, even though Tibolon particularly may have uh, also an, an androgenic uh, uh, action that may be uh, useful in this in this uh, population uh, of women. Um, another point uh, to be highlighted is the duration of treatment. Um, we have seen that uh, um, this continuation of uh, hormone therapy was uh, not very common in our in our uh, sample, but the um, mean age of discontinuation was relatively uh, low, about uh, uh, 43 years or so, well below uh, the uh, recommended 50 to 51 years. Um, and this may highlight um, the duration of treatment that still represents a concern both for women and for healthcare professionals. Um, so we think that uh, there are um, issues about uh, uh, an overestimation of the risk associated with the long-term use of hormone therapy, especially breast cancer risk. Uh, but uh, it should be uh, made very clear during the counseling of this patient and uh, women should be reassured that there is no specific cutoff in terms of uh, uh, hormone therapy use in, generally, in general, and especially in POI and early menopause um, that are, um, who are uh, much younger than older menopausal women uh, in uh, whom um, the studies have been performed. Uh, so controversies existing around the hormone therapy risk, especially uh, about breast safety, do not apply to these younger menopausal women. And the second point is that uh, it appears that there is a poor awareness of the benefits of hormone therapy in terms of osteoporosis and cardiovascular disease prevention. And this is uh, uh, why uh, during the consultation, it is necessary 
uh, to raise uh, uh, awareness and educate patients about the preventive role of hormone therapy. Uh, indeed, uh, um, the duration of therapy seems uh, uh, really important uh, uh, for uh, cardiovascular disease prevention. Uh, in this uh, recent uh, poll analysis of uh, 15 observational long, uh, longitudinal studies, uh, the authors found that uh, women with uh, POI and early menopause uh, using uh, hormone therapy for longer than 10 years at the lowest risk of cardiovascular disease compared to uh, women who never use, uh, used uh, hormone therapy or used it for uh, less than 10 years. And the reduction in risk was uh, uh, the greatest uh, if uh, hormone, therapy, uh, hormone therapy was initiated early after diagnosis, so uh, within one year from amenorrhea. And this is a very actual topic. <clears throat> As you can see, uh, very recently, the American Heart Association has published this uh, scientific statement uh, to raise awareness uh, of the role of menopause transition on uh, cardiovascular disease risk, uh, <clears throat> which was not uh, in, in somehow included in the previous guidelines of disease prevention uh, on cardiovascular disease prevention uh, in women. Um, and this is uh, important to uh, promote the research uh, in, uh, in view of finding uh, uh, primary preventive strategies as cardiovascular disease in general uh, represent the uh, first cause of mortality in women, especially uh, in uh, when uh, menopause occurs early, uh, we had the opportunity to have a real specific uh, uh, treatment as a primary prevention that is represented by hormone therapy indeed, of course, uh, accompanied by uh, lifestyle uh, interventions to reduce uh, modifiable risk factors. And finally, the estrogen doses. We have seen that uh, in our sample, mass women were on standard to low dose uh, estrogenic supplementation, while uh, <clears throat> uh, guidelines and recommendations uh, suggest to follow the principle of maintaining circulating estradiol between uh, 50 and 100 picograms per ml. Um, <clears throat> let's say that uh, the, the choice uh, of the dose should be uh, individualized. Uh, very recently, uh, an, uh, um, another review have, focus, have proposed a uh, patient-oriented um, uh, prescript um, approach to um, promote a tailored uh, hormone therapy to POI in early menopausal women. And this is a, a table that uh, sum, um, summarizes the uh, um, suggested dosage uh, that should be adjusted uh, also according to uh, age of the patient, uh, the reproductive uh, um, phase, uh, and of course, uh, it should be um, modulated to uh, avoid uh, side effects uh, to, uh, and also to um, uh, include um, possible implications on comorbidities such as migraine and so on. Um, so, uh, we can say that uh, our uh, study uh, confirms what has already been noticed by other authors, that uh, principles of hormone therapy prescription does not always uh, uh, correspond to actual practice. And uh, we have seen that there are many reasons. First of all, the lack of uh, randomized control trial data uh, and uh, uh, data from longer-term longitudinal studies that uh, uh, confirm the, uh, the 
um, symptom and quality of life benefits of specific regimens. Um, another important point to, uh, that, that has been made that, uh, is that the availability and cost of hormone types may vary considerably um, in, from country to country and even uh, within the same countries. So <clears throat> this is, uh, of course, something that uh, uh, affects the prescriptive ability of the uh, healthcare provider. And uh, always remember the uh, importance uh, uh, of patient uh, preference for uh, perceived peer-friendly preparation uh, to improve uh, compliance for a, a long-term treatment. So the cross-sectional nature of our study um, enable us uh, to provide a snapshot of attitudes and behavior uh, of uh, hormone therapy prescription in a real life setting, but of course uh, uh, does not offer reliable information about the, the patient-centered clinical decision-making. In our study, uh, it's confirmed the uh, general use of standard or even low-dose hormone therapy, which may be suboptimal to counter out symptoms and uh, conditions associated with POI and early menopause. Um, this condition uh, deserves a special care in a lifespan perspective uh, in order to um, <clears throat> maintain um, treatment for as long as it, it is needed, reassuring women and promoting a long-term uh, um, prevention of uh, the, the, the consequences of this diagnosis. However, there are no uh, evidence-based algorithms for an effective management. Uh, hopefully, more longitudinal analysis will give us information on the preventive importance of specific therapeutic choices or even uh, data collection in uh, global databases from uh, um, specialized POI clinic all over the world. Um, at the moment, the, um, our uh, um, best chance is to try to educate uh, women uh, and healthcare providers on the multitude of short and longer term uh, risk associated with early hormonal deprivation uh, as a key to promote both quality of life and healthy longevity in this population. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> thank you. Thank you very much, Laura. And now we have <clears throat> I say, receive a huge series of questions. First of all, I would like to make a comment that uh, uh, as your study was done in this in these recent years, and then you have analyzed some what happened. Uh, in patients which were treated and analyzed in the last uh, 10 years. We have, it was a period where uh, the WHI study have made a very bad information about uh, possible risk of hormone replacement therapy who have also touched the patient and also touched uh, the healthcare practitioner. And then I think that the climate was uh, probably uh, too much against uh, the long-term continuation of this treatment. What is your impression about that one? Uh, yes, for sure. Um, those studies have uh, had uh, an influence on uh, prescription of a hormone therapy. Uh, for instance, in, uh, uh, in Italy, uh, there was a survey uh, in the years after the publication and uh, a drop in hormone therapy prescription was uh, really uh, evident. Um, let's say that uh, from, from that uh, study, for example, uh, the, age, the age of menopause was uh, uh, um, a determinant uh, in which some way uh, maintained prescription in this population. But of course, uh, uh, there was a lot of uh, uh, also media information that uh, uh, has a, an impact, uh, uh, of course, uh, on the patients. Uh, so uh, it was not 
I, I think uh, it was more even more difficult to uh, counsel uh, them and reassure them that uh, these data do not apply to their age, but uh, uh, to older menopausal women. Yes, thank you very much. And then now we move to the question. <clears throat> we have received a huge series of questions. There are now 45. And uh, uh, Sami Odahib asked, what sexual function will be affected more in women with POI? Desire, lubrication, pain, satisfaction, orgasm, or what? Ah, uh, well, that, that, that is not a straightforward question. Um, well, uh, let's say uh, sexual function in uh, premature ovarian insufficiency uh, may be uh, affected by several ways. Uh, of course, uh, uh, genitourinary uh, syndrome of menopause, so uh, vulval vaginal atrophy uh, is an aspect to uh, take care of. Um, let's say that uh, systemic hormone therapy at higher dosage uh, can in some case relieve uh, the symptoms, but it may not be sufficient. So local treatment, as we can, we have seen, uh, is uh, uh, quite uh, commonly prescribed for this aim. Um, of course, desire is an issue. Um, both uh, um, associated uh, with a possible. Uh, uh, androgen insufficiency because uh, there are uh, studies uh, uh, that uh, suggest uh, um, that women with POI, so not, not only surgically menopausal women, but also with spontaneous POI, um, have, uh, may have a lower circulating level of uh, testosterone. So this may, of course, contribute to uh, low desire, uh, but we have also to think about the biopsychological model, which is very important in this session because the, the diagnosis per se is uh, really distressful. Uh, it may really interfere with the uh, self-image of the woman. Uh, infertility as well may have implications in terms of uh, uh, perception of sexual function. So, um, uh, sexual counseling, which is uh, always very important in sexual dysfunction, is uh, even more important uh, in this uh, uh, population. So um, it's difficult to say which domain is uh, mostly affected. Uh, I think all domain uh, can be affected. We have to uh, find the one more affected in each single patient to start uh, uh, mm, to manage that uh, because we know that uh, uh, all domains in turn are uh, uh, highly interconnected in female sexuality. So, Thank you. And there are also other questions related to the sexuality who touch an important point. In women who complain a low sexual desire, do you believe that any androgen assay will be of interest? And in such a case, what kind of androgen you can suggest to measure? Um, well, uh, also because mm, we have our own opinion too, I will tell you after. Okay. So we know that the uh, testosterone measurements in women are quite uh, uh, difficult because uh, uh, DSAs are poorly. Um, uh, sensitive uh, to um, and the studies uh, that uh, have tried to relate uh, uh, circulating testosterone and the sexual functions were not uh, always uh, uh, very uh, precise. So, um, in, indeed, uh, um, Another option uh, uh, would be to uh, measure um, the hydrandrosterone, the DA, so the um, hydrandrosterone, okay. yeah, uh, which actually is a hormone um, precursor. So it's, uh, it, it is uh, converted both to androgen and estrogen. So uh, 
again, is not uh, uh, so specific and there are no studies correlating uh, it directly with uh, sexuality. Uh, so, um, <clears throat> actually, uh, uh, QI woman with uh, uh, low desire and who is distressed uh, by this low desire may uh, have a trial with androgen therapy despite, mm, mm, let's say, the uh, measurement of uh, circulating androgen level. Yes, I think so. I think I agree also with you. And uh, what uh, we suggest also is uh, to measure <clears throat> the hydrocandrostan sulfate, as, well, as you were mentioning, and uh, to try to and to check if the concentration are corresponding to the normal age of the woman. But also we have that problem that uh, local testosterone, which is available in Australia, for example, in other country, is not yet available in our country because. Yeah. Uh, uh, local testosterone use also to prevent the aging of the external genitalia can be a positive suggestion. What did you believe about the possible use of testosterone? Uh, yes, um, I believe that uh, local testosterone may be uh, an option, um, especially in women who respond uh, not so well to uh, estrogenic, uh, local estrogen alone. There is also a, a formulation of uh, um, dia, uh, of prasterone, uh, vaginal prasterone available now uh, in Europe and uh, US, which uh, may have uh, um, an effect on the vaginal atrophy. Um, let's say that the systemic testosterone uh, may work more on the aspect of desire compared to local testosterone. But again, we do not have uh, um, licensed products for women uh, in our country also for uh, systemic testosterone. So it's quite uh, difficult to prescribe off-label a drug which is uh, uh, produced for a male population. So um, we, we hope that uh, in the past we had uh, we had um, a transdermal patch which uh, could be used, but uh, it's not available at uh, at the moment. So. Not anymore. But there are now several questions concerning the importance of genetic investigation, mostly in younger individuals. Yeah. Apostolos Campagianis ask in women of age 39, other ask in women under 30. Do you believe that it's important to have a genetic investigation to assess uh, the, and to precise the diagnosis of the patient before to start a treatment? Yes, of course. Um, ideally, uh, basic genetic investigations, including karyotype and uh, fragile X permutation, uh, should be screened in all POI patients, so below 40 years of, of age. Uh, of course, uh, it is uh, even more relevant for young patients, uh, um, especially, well, um, for patients with uh, primary amenorrhea, um, in whom the uh, rate of uh, chromosomal abnormalities uh, is, is quite high, is, uh, may, may reach 20%. So in these women, absolutely is, uh, um, let's say, um, uh, um, we, are, we are forced to do this examination when available, of course. Um, <clears throat> there are um, new possibilities, uh, but of course in the research, in, in the field of research, uh, about uh, screening for um, um, possible genes implicated in premature ovarian insufficiency. And I, I hope and I think that in the next uh, years they will be uh, valuable uh, um, for uh, more general screening. But at the moment, uh, uh, at least the karyotype and the fragile X permutation should be um, searched in all women with POI when available. 
Thank you. And then now and then there are several questions. One is from Stephanie Picard and many others. They are related to the duration of treatment, you know, because uh, you were mentioning what it was your observation, but and also what you were also mentioning in your latest slides uh, that a series of data suggests that the treatment have to be prolonged if it is, if the woman she is health, if she feel well, the treatment have to be prolonged as much as possible. And then there are question, there is an age limitation for the treatment or the patient can go on. Even when she reached the age of the man, mm -hmm. she can go on or she have to stop. No, she can go on. Um, of course, uh, uh, we have to reevaluate with our patient uh, uh, her clinical conditions. For example, it may be useful to look at bone mineral density and to evaluate the risk of osteoporosis. Uh, because uh, mm, women uh, with uh, osteoporosis have, at uh, 51 uh, years of age may benefit from going on for some years with, uh, with the treatment. Uh, another option is to um, try to uh, load, um, lower the dose uh, of uh, estrogenic supplementation around the time of physiological menopause and see what happens in terms of symptoms. Because uh, if we lower the dose and the woman start to have symptoms again, so uh, this, this is a signal that uh, she uh, still needs some hormonal supplementation. So uh, it's, uh, it's always to balance the risk and benefits uh, uh, um, of continuing the treatment. Of course, we, uh, we should take into consideration uh, uh, breast cancer risk, uh, um, uh, cardiovascular risk, uh, but uh, th there's no uh, a limitation uh, of time and age uh, at which we have, to, we, we have to discontinue treatment. Sure. Yes, it's an interesting other series of questions I put all together. <clears throat> speaking about uh, the necessity to preserve also some contraceptive aspect. You were mentioning that uh, estrogen replacement, hormone replacement can also in some individual restore some spontaneous fertility. And then patients who thought, who are completely, uh, who need the contraception, they have to be advised. And an interesting question from Professor Kamenov and from also other, they suggest, uh, he's suggesting that the possible use of uh, a normal IUD, a levonorgestrel IUD, and together with the transdermal uh, estrogen, and transdermal estrogen for us a safe treatment for this patient. And other, and other questions are also related to the important difference between oral and transcutaneous or transdermal estrogen administration for safety. Can you make some comment about uh, the levonorgestrel IUD and uh, the and why oral or transcutaneous or transdermal estrogen therapy can have a difference? Yes. Uh, so uh, of course, uh, um, levonorgestrel IUD may be a good option for contraception and for um, endometrial protection, especially in uh, patients um, with uh, uh, risk factors for endometrial uh, uh, hyperplasia, for instance, of these patients, uh, uh, who may also benefit indeed from a transdermal supplementation uh, of uh, estrogen rather than uh, no, uh, oral for um, the cardiovascular risk factor. So let, let's go <laughs> in order because <laughs> otherwise uh, it is uh, a little bit confusing. Uh, uh, so for contraception, uh, for sure, uh, levonorgestrel IUD is uh, maybe an option. Uh, Obviously, uh, we have to consider the um, age of our patient because uh, it may, may be more suitable uh, uh, in, uh, uh, let's say, um, women uh, not, not really, really young. I mean, uh, um, maybe is, a, uh, is an option more accepted 
uh, um, <clears throat> in older POI women, while uh, adolescents uh, uh, POI women may prefer a uh, uh, more peer-friendly um, pre treatment uh, such as the contraceptive pill taken as an oral pill as they uh, as their uh, age uh, match uh, uh, mm, normally menstruating women. So um, it, it it is a a good choice for uh, some women uh, the uh, levon registered IUD. Um, as far as the transdermal versus oral administration of of hormone replacement therapy, uh, we know that uh, oral. Um, uh, estrogen administration um, results in a first pass effect. So the liver uh, metabolism uh, <clears throat> affects the uh, clotting factor. So in this way, uh, the transdermal administration avoiding the first uh, pass effect has a, a more uh, safe profile on uh, this point of view. Um, this is particularly true uh, when we compare uh, transdermal estradiol and uh, etinyl estradiol uh, taken per us uh, with combined hormonal contraception. We know that etinyl estradiol is a very potent uh, um, estrogen which is highly metabolized by the liver and has a long life uh, um, of uh, circulating metabolites and uh, it uh, has a, a more negative impact than uh, estradiol, particularly transdermal, both on, uh, um, <clears throat> on uh, lipid profile, clotting mm -hmm. factors, and uh, of course also angiotensin uh, running system, so hypertension, uh, so, mm, uh, affecting uh, more uh, blood pressure balance uh, uh, compared to uh, natural estradiol, especially when given transdermal. So uh, for all these reasons, uh, um, the uh, transdermal route uh, may be more beneficial, but uh, we have to consider that uh, studies uh, on these issues uh, in menopausal women have been performed mainly on older menopausal yeah. women. So yes. we do not really uh, know if they uh, apply, well, rationally, uh, they may be applying also to uh, POI women, but uh, uh, more studies may be needed in this yes. population. Yeah. Yes, absolutely. I totally agree with you. And there are also some other questions related, as you were mentioning, about the fact that, that in younger individuals, the continuous oral contraception is perceived more friendly than if you give a menopause, uh, a menopause um, <laughs> labelled therapy, who also give to the patient the image that she is in fact in menopause, because they want to forget. I would mm -hmm. like to have a comment from you about that point. Yes, uh, as I as I said previously, uh, young women may prefer, uh, uh, let's say, peer friendly uh, or a combined hormonal contraception just to uh, to to feel more similar to their peers. Uh, so, uh, of course, um, <clears throat> again, uh, there are few comparative studies. Um, between uh, combined hormonal contraception and hormone uh, replacement therapy in uh, POI women. It seems that uh, <clears throat> uh, hormone replacement therapy may have benefits uh, on uh, bone health uh, compared to combined hormonal contraception. Uh, so the, this may be a reason uh, to prefer uh, the, the uh, second option. Uh, but of course, uh, mm, very young women may mm, be managed uh, um, initially with a contraception and then possibly switch in a, to another, uh, to a traditional hormone replacement therapy later in life. 
uh, because the importance is uh, uh, to give treatment and to promote uh, quality of life. Uh, uh, yes, of course, uh, uh, always thinking about uh, long term consequences, uh, but uh, if uh, a young adolescent uh, comes, to, comes to our office uh, and uh, she, she really wants uh, to avoid the hormone replacement therapy because uh, uh, of the uh, psychological impact uh, of premature menopause, they may, may be something we can do. And uh, I, I think that is a bio-containing pill uh, should be more uh, studied in this population uh, to really understand that may have a plus uh, compared to eating in this tradio comparing uh, containing pill uh, being uh, something like a bridge between uh, yeah. traditional combined <clears throat> hormonal contraception and hormone replacement therapy. And also I would like to add a comment, you know, that, you know, when you, you face this patient, you never know what will happen in their, in their future life. And some of them, they reach in a different, they go and gone with the time, they reach the moment when they will ask for an assisted reproductive technology to have a pregnancy. Yeah. And for this, it's very important that you have maintained the biology of the genital tissues, the biology of the uterus, the good reactivity of the endometrium, and then to have maintained an adequate estrogenization. We can never know what will happen later on in the life. And certainly, if I would like to have your comment, in a young girl who have the perception of the premature ovarian insufficiency, you have to give her the, the clear image that she can be became, she can became pregnant once by other means, you, we can provide an adequate hormone therapy. We can look also for an ovocyte coming from abroad and she can bring a pregnancy and she can become mother. I think this is a very important message. How may, do you have never found in our group of patients, patients who were asking for fertility, for prevention of possible fertility for the future? Yes, of course. Uh, uh, yes, it is actually one of the main concerns of our patient uh, when we come for first consultation. It is always uh, very important to do counseling about uh, future fertility and uh, uh, make clear about the best options. Of course, uh, um, we always say that spontaneous pregnancy can be achieved, but uh, uh, it is very rare, so uh, the patient uh, have to know that the possibility is very low, but uh, that we, uh, we now have other means. As you, as you said, uh, of donation is a real um, possibility. Um, so, uh, and of course, uh, in this, uh, in this, uh, Mm, perspective uh, hormone replacement therapy is something uh, more physiological that uh, uh, mm, gives trophism to the uterus and the matrium. So, in this case, uh, uh, if uh, if there is the idea of an ovary donation, is uh, uh, is right to choose a sequential hormone replacement therapy uh, to prepare the uterus for optimal uh, embryo. Um, implantation. Okay. Yeah. okay, then I think, dear friends, uh, we had a beautiful hour and 15 minutes uh, discussing with Laura. And then uh, I would like uh, to thank uh, you for the presentation, for the clear discussion, and for the beautiful message that you are bringing. This is the importance of our journal. Our journal is a new option of the Gynecological Endocrinology Society. And uh, as a last uh, born child, in addition to gynecological and endocrinology, we want to invite all our uh, uh, people come with us uh, today to send their publication to gynecological and reproductive endocrinology and metabolism. And I thank you, Laura, very much for to support uh, our journal with the beautiful paper. And, uh, and thanking you, I will also invite <clears throat> all uh, our participants to join us also the 8th of March, which will be the day of this, the day of the woman, uh, to have another GRAM uh, uh, webinar. 
And the next uh, GRAM, uh, GRAM webinar will be devoted to a beautiful paper published also in the late last issue of Gynecological and Reproductive Endocrinology Metabolism, which will follow, which will follow the presentation of Laura today. And it will be the resumption of ovarian function and successful pregnancy in a patient with premature ovarian insufficiency after a long-term hormone replacement therapy. Then you will have a second uh, chapter of this fantastic history of the premature ovarian insufficiency and all the possibilities. And Professor Svetlana uh, Vujovic, she will be the presenter at our next uh, GREM seminar. Thank you very much, Laura. And we Thank wish you. for you all a beautiful time, also because we are aware that Laura, she's approaching her delivery time. And then, <laughs> and then thank you and the compliments from all the community of our uh, uh, readers and uh, participating to Graham publication. Thank you, Laura, again. Thank you very much. And, and uh, good success <laughs> for your pregnancy, your delivery, and your uh, and please all best wishes to continue in your, in your beautiful career at university. Thank you thank very much. And thank you, everybody. We will see each other the 8th of March, second chapter on premature ovarian insufficiency. Goodbye. <laughs>